Imagine you've done four months of rehearsing with Michael Jackson for the final This Is It tour. He bids the band farewell after the rehearsal finishes at 12.30am and within hours he's passed away. Fast forward two weeks, at the same venue, on the same stage, as the world watches on, you look down and you notice your left hand is shaking as you're about to play the intro to Man in the Mirror to accompany the members of the Jackson 5 to carry their brother's coffin off stage for the final time. That was our reality for the guest today. Welcome to the Stage Dave Podcast. Okay, welcome to the Stage Left Podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. This podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Go to thestageleftpodcast.com for all episodes featuring musicians who discuss in detail the recording, writing and performing processes from working with the likes of Beyonce, Guns N' Roses, Elvis Presley, David Bowie, The Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, Queen, Nick Cave, Oasis, The 1975, Bob Dylan, John Mayer and Kraftwerk. Today we are joined by composer, producer and multi-instrumentalist Mo Pleasure, who was Michael Jackson's bandmate in the This Is It tour that never happened and spent eight years as musical director for Grammy Hall of Famers Earth, Wind & Fire. Today we'll be discussing how musicians can thrive in high pressure environments, what it was like playing with Ray Charles at the Royal Festival Hall, what Mo learned from working with MJ at such close proximity, and how to overcome challenges in a live and recording setting. As someone whose first ever concert was Michael Jackson's uh, Bad Tour, uh, and as someone who had tickets for the This Is It shows, uh, this is going to be a special episode for me. So welcome to the Boogie Wonderland that is Mo Pleasure. Thanks for joining us today, Mo. How's it going? Oh, it's going great, Chris. I'm so happy to be here. Good stuff. Thank you. And we're in London, and um, you know, how are you? finding you know living in london on this kind of damp cold overcast mm. august day in the height of our summer <laughs> so used to it chris i'm telling you i've actually been here now about four years um you know on and off before i was kind of back and forth a lot more to the states but now i'm kind of sticking it out so i've been through a few winters and summers and and you know the whole lot so i'm used to it and you were born in uh, hartford in connecticut is that's that right? absolutely true now yes. for, we've got listeners on every continent and many of them won't have been to connecticut so can you paint mm. a picture of what connecticut was like uh, growing up and mm. how it compares to now in connecticut it's well it's you know pretty much if i go back to my hometown which is guilford connecticut actually yep. um um, where I grew up, it's pretty much the same place that I left. And it was a beautiful place with great people, uh, very like kind of liberal community, a lot of arts. Um, it's on the shoreline, so we had the beach, and nice. you know, I'm kind of a water freak and all that. And uh, it was great because my dad was a principal of one of the schools there, and you know, st- um, he's long passed away since, but um, very respected man. When I go there, we're kind of you know, still royalty. And the funny (laughs) thing about it, yeah, it's great. The funny thing about it was that, you know, um, we were a black family that moved there in 1969 and it's a completely white town. Mm -hmm. Um, There are probably like four, four black families when I grew up and there are probably still about four black families there now Yeah. or um, other, you know, ethnicities and stuff. But the people, it never felt that way because the people were so welcoming and so, you know, really about, um, you know, about people as opposed to, you know, race or anything yeah. like that. So, And your yeah. dad being a principal, did he, was he happy that you went into being a musician or was he someone who wanted you to have a inverted commas proper job? A little bit of <laughs> both, Chris, you know, because he actually was a musician himself. Oh, he was right. an incredible singer, um, never professionally, but very much so much, you know, in the community and at, at his schools mm-hmm. that he would, uh, he would always be singing with the choir, or the you know, um, whatever the school groups were, and also um, with the church and stuff. Um, you went to Louisiana quite a lot and experienced yes. like some quite first-hand inequalities in regards yes. to segregation. And I believe back then, was it a case that if you were a black family traveling through some of those areas, you couldn't stay at some of the hotels? That's that absolutely correct? true, yeah. Wow. Yeah. At what stage of your mm-hmm. life did you realize how wrong that was? Well, even back then, you know, because the reason I was going to Louisiana a lot is because my grandparents were there. So my mother and father are from Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is down in the south. And um, so I would go down there and we would be, you know, I'd be asking my grandfather why we couldn't, you know, drink from this water fountain or go to this pool and this kind of thing because I had uh, white and colored back then, I would mm. say colored. Um, and uh, this what and that. Was his res- what was his response to that? Like when, when you uh, asked him, did he lie or did he actually say? That oh, no, it was, there was like no way to lie about it. It was just absolutely true, you know, that, that you know, segregation we called it Jim Crow existed and that's just the way it was. Um, there was a white side of town, black side of town, this whole thing, white rec cent- recreation center, 
you know, black recreation. Everything was split that way mm. and still is. I mean, it's the actual laws have changed, but the actual, uh, my, my mother still lives there in Louisiana, kind of in the, um, in a small town, and if I go down there now, it's it's it really hasn't changed much at all. That was my next mm. question: How has America mm. changed, and has it changed mm. enough for you? Yeah, well, it's kind of like yes, it's changed, and yes, it has it. You know, um, as we're learning now, we're having a lot of problems with with uh, race, and you know, kind of just division and all that kind of stuff. And I, I've always felt it, you know, because I've I've been in the world. You know, I, I actually, obviously, been around the world quite a few times, and um, back to the states and all that. So I've have noticed. You know, mm-hmm. not only the changes in the states, but how we're regarded in the mm-hmm. states by other countries and um, people around the world. So um, it's a little bit of a um, trying time right now, but I think we kind of had to go through it, and I could see it coming for a long time. Well, London welcomes you with open arms, and um, you uh, would have been you. based here, I'm guessing, for the uh, This Is It shows because it was supposed to be at the yeah. O2. How far down the line were you? I mean, had like uh, your accommodation been agreed? Did you yeah. know where you'd be staying and stuff like that? Or yes, we had like we are. Uh, they told us what our apartments were going to be, and um, you know, we were like trying to figure out like because you know we were getting a lot of endorsements from companies, so. Uh, I was saying, you know, I'm gonna have these kind of speakers in my, you know, in my studio and this and that, and companies were willing to give us this. And the the cool thing about it was, um, it was gonna be such that we could play a show, and literally, boom, play the last note, and I could get on a, a tube and be at my apartment in like ten minutes without oh. even going to the dressing room, you know. So wow. it was gonna be a very easy thing, you know, back and forth to the O2. Um, we were we were all excited about it, and it was not. It was like basically nine days before we were supposed to come to um, the UK when Michael died. Yeah. yeah, and so how ready were you from the kind of concert experience mm. point of view? I mean, if you'd had a concert three days later, do you sure. think you could have nailed it, or was there still bits and pieces you need to put together? Oh, no, we were so confident. We, mm. we knew we had something really special. Um, it felt like, at the time, it felt like, you know, Michael was pretty much ready, and we had a pretty, um, you know, non-intensive schedule while we were here. I mean, I think it was three nights a week or something mm. like that, and um, there was lots of hiatus time you know where we weren't actually playing so it was it was a cool thing and you know and also in this industry having a job for a couple of years that you could kind of just you know rely on was it was a great feeling as well you know so so from a musician's point of view you know you're there's a business that you've got your own business and what you're doing with this like do you get compensated in that kind of thing like or did you just you know you get Mm -hmm. i guess you got paid for the rehearsals like Mm -hmm. that's such a difficult situation to experience you know you you signed up probably for a couple of years so we did and it was supposed to be even more after that we were told by you know by management and so on but um yeah a matter of fact it was devastating because we were let off in the middle of the summer without a gig and we were we were paid rehearsal pay and nothing else um, by AEG and um, and then the movie came out as well and we weren't paid for the movie either really you know? yeah, yeah we weren't paid for the movie um, and that's something that uh, you know I don't like talk about a lot but it's absolutely true we were actually left with no, no money and we were left with no job in the middle of the summer wow um so I had tickets for um, that show. So you remember there was uh, there was supposed to be ten shows at the beginning, and then it kind of sure. got extended to fifty shows. And I had tickets for the I think it was the second third night when the, uh, the, the for the first ten, which wow. in the end would have been bolted on to, to the end. I think it was because things right. got delayed. Um, but you know, it was built as kind of an entirely new concert experience. Mo, tell me what I would have experienced. Well, the thing about it was, you know, uh, even if you look at the movie, this is it. There were things in it that we hadn't even we hadn't even experienced. There were some gags, as we call them, some tricks and. Um, um, uh, you, you know, at the end, I couldn't wait to see Michael leave on a jet plane. You know, was that what was going to happen? So what was, was the last gonna image? Happen. He was going to go on a jet plane. But we had we had a um, we had an airplane that was up on the video screen that had a uh, place for Michael to climb the stairs, probably wave to everybody, and then then get in it. And, and however they were going to do it, it was going to actually be some type of I don't know hologram experience yeah. or whatever to um, for him flying a jet plane over the audience <laughs> to get out or something like that. <laughs> Um, and there were some other things as well. Um, in uh, Earth Song, I remember there was going to be a giant bulldozer. And, it comes you know, out on the stage. Sure. Yeah. So we, there were a few uh, gags and things that we hadn't really done yet. But other than that, the show was like put together, yeah. um, which took a while. We have to learn all the songs in different keys. You know, That's to, interesting. You know, what, in case mm, he wanted to change the key yes, on the night? He, yes. he, oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, and he had to, and that it may not seem like a big thing, but in, in terms of just actually, you know, not just knowing the songs, but having all the... You know, as a keyboard player, having all our splits, all keyboard players know what that is. Like, mm-hmm. uh, say on one keyboard, you have more than one sound. 
um, all that changes when you change the key because then where the split points are are different and you have to remember them all in your head. Um, even different guitars because uh, something like Beat It, um, if the key was too low, then all the strings would just be flop, floppy, right. you know, yeah, so yeah. they had to build actually guitars for the different keys and that kind of thing. So there was a lot, a lot of preparation. By the time um, Michael um, unfortunately passed away, we were we were so ready for the show. Like we, he could have just um, said any key, said any key on any song, change the order, whatever, and we were ready. And is it true that um, F sharp is the worst key? <laughs> <laughs> Still, absolutely. Yeah, Chris. Still yeah, that's, oh, there we go. So hopefully, we would have <laughs> avoided that for you. <laughs> musicians listen to this a lot of them will have similar experiences to, to bands on stage but not many you know at that kind of amateur level if you like playing pubs and gigs and that kind of thing sure. will have a musical director so i wonder um could you break down what the musical director's role is because you did it at earth wind mm. and fire yep. um and where the if you like not the power lies mm. but there was an interest i watched this is it the other night two nights oh, ago great. preparation for this and okay. I, was it michael beard and michael beard and yes right yes. and there was an interesting bit where he kind of challenged mj a little bit i sure. felt um on kind of that he maybe should have been at the rehearsals and that kind of thing yeah, and, sure. and mj was like we well, just learn what's on the record and he said yeah but i need you and i just sure. wonder where the not the power lies but who has the final say in that situation well you know i found that it's 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 kind of a you know it's a team effort of course but there's also like because as a musical director you're kind of um, try you the definitely your first um, line of business is to make the artist happy and create what it is that they're trying to you know put forth to the people. But at the same time, you have to not just communicate that to a band or or whatever, um, but you also have to deal with a lot of personalities in the band as well. Mm-hmm. So you know a lot of it's psychology and how do I talk to this person if I'm dealing with like uh, an Earth, Wind, and Fire? That's the artist actually was three you know three of members um the rest of us were basically side men of sorts you know but um it's different than like now i'm bet midler's music director yeah. so i'm dealing with bet um and you know we'll start out with 61 songs and uh try every key and tempo and all that and we're whittling it down to about 20 25 songs for for a show and um as the show is progressing we're always changing things as well so i think it's i think it's the kind of thing that like you really get a, a serious relationship with the artist um, and you know you get, learn how to work together so there's a lot of times I'll if I think that something is really important that I'll you know challenge an artist and s- sometimes I win sometimes I don't mm-hmm. I'm always open to um, interpretations from the band about what they think is best to do it and um, but I just think that as a music director that one of the main things that they want is confidence so that you know if there's going to be a change or something's going on, then you're the and, and I mean sometimes at the at the moment, you know, you might be in the middle of a show and something changes, you're the captain of the ship and you have to be very decisive. And even if you're wrong, you have to um, exude confidence so that everybody goes along with you wow. know, what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And who's accountable for finding sounds? So mm-hmm. you play keyboard sure. on. I think you did the intro to Man in the Mirror. Is that right? The it's dun, true. Dun, dun, dun. I did. Right. So mm-hmm. how, that's recorded 30 years ago, 35 sure. years ago. Where do you find those exact sounds so you can play those parts again? And who's oh, accountable? Yeah. Is that the music director? Is it the individual? Or is it someone else? Well, we have some really great keyboard programmers with us. Right. You know, So there's always that. So, uh, And then you know, I do a little bit myself. So if you can get yourself kind of in the ballpark of what the sounds are, then it's all tweaking. Is you it know? right? And you've got, you know, say you're working... A month um, on you know in a in a rehearsal before you even get to production rehearsal. By the time you get it together, all the levels and all the sounds are tweaked in, and your um, your front of house engineer and monitor engineers know exactly you know like I they'll stay in a room with um, with some uh, near field monitors while you're doing rehearsal every day, and then 
as you stop and you, you're going to have a sandwich or go eat or something, and here comes the engineer saying, hey, can you bring down that bell sound, you know, 2 <laughs> dB? And I, so it's like, you know, by the time you actually get to the point of playing, it's been well tweaked, you know. And you accredited on that, on This Is It shows, as playing keys, trumpets, mm, and true. guitar. Um, what did you play on it? Can you mm. pick out what, what did you particular play? Was there a particular part you liked playing or, or highlight that you were at the fore? Yeah, well, I did, you know, I played keyboards on most of it. So it was like I had four keyboards and, mm. you know, a lot of splits on those, all the pedals for, you know, volume and sustain and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there were two of us. So Michael Bearden was and on you. the other side and we covered a lot. Then we also had um, Bashiri Johnson um, doing percussion, and he had a lot of electronic percussion. He was playing with his hands and his feet. So, you know, you'd see him, and he looked like he was running or, or jogging and sometimes, and he was actually doing, like, maybe hand claps with his feet, that kind of thing. Wow. Then we had um, Sugarfoot Moffitt on the drums, and he had a lot of triggers as well. So, um, all together, we were able to cover, you know, And what so happens much. if it's the first night of the mm. tour... And Michael Bearden falls ill and he can't make it because he's really unwell. What would have happened Ooh. on that, that, that kind of year? <laughs> I, I don't even well, we would probably be trying to like somehow nurse him back to health really yeah. quickly, you know. Um, but let's okay, yeah. let's say he's fallen over broken mm. or, or something like that. Oh, he God. couldn't do his job. Sure. Like, is there backup plans or plan Bs and plan Cs you for know, those scale shows? It happened to me. I had to do. I was on Janet Jackson's gig, and the other keyboard player had to leave on a day's notice. Um, and I literally had them bring his keyboard rig to my left side, um, which was identical to my rig. So I knew where all the sounds were and everything. And then next night, you know, I, I stayed up all night and, you know, kind of choreographed it. A lot, a lot of keyboard playing is choreography. Like, you know, how do I play this and this at the same time? And Fine. how do I switch sounds in time to get to that? And, you know, uh, what, where are the splits and you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, had, I did have to once actually um, do that. And then I had to cover everything. And then I was the only keyboard player because, uh, you know, they saved, <laughs> saved the salary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and what did you play trumpet on? So trumpet was like, you know, I was playing on jam and that kind of stuff with oh, Michael. Nice. Um, sometimes I would actually play keyboards and trumpet at the same time. Really? Uh, yeah, like, you know, play horn parts on the keyboard. So one-handed trumpet exactly. like that, and the other hand on other the hand keyboard. other hand on the keyboard. And um, actually even some of the samples of the horn sounds were me um, in addition to the, say the Yamaha sounds yeah. in the keyboard, we we go and we'd have me um, sample my horn. Um, a guy named Dave Polich, uh, who was our programmer, and we do a bunch of different things: falls, you know, that kind of thing. Nice. And that's me, just straight notes and dips and whatever kind of thing. And then he would just integrate them with the sounds that we had. So a lot of times, even what I was playing was me, you know, with uh, on the keyboards was actually me. got the dancers who went through a very extensive audition process oh, yeah. was it the same as an audition process probably not as physical I'd imagine band, but, yeah. Yeah. but for the band like how did you what was the audition process how did you, you know I was very lucky because I didn't have to audition at all I had known Michael Bearden since the 80s and we were two up-and-coming you know musician uh, keyboardists um, and then we'd also done a lot of gigs together you know jazz gigs and um, um, you know just stuff like that and um, so it was it was a situation. It was kind of crazy how I got the gig because they already had a keyboardist, oh. um, and he wasn't able to do it due to contractual problems with some TV reality show, uh, voice yeah, show, American or something. Idol or something. Yeah, yeah it was right. like, I think it was American Idol actually. Right. And you'd be uh, so gutted about that. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah. If you think about it, he still had a job. Yeah, you know, true, but, true, true. But true. the um, yeah, so it just happened that he after so I came in about a uh, three weeks to a month late uh, to rehearsals, and I had to learn everything kind of quickly, which is which was easy for me because first of all, all the sounds were already kind of already in place mm. for my keyboards, nice. and it was Michael Jackson, so I already knew the songs, you know. So uh, it was it was great, and I fit right into the band, you know. As far as uh, you know, the band was like very much a family unit. You know, we all were like brothers and sisters working mm. together to, you know, get this thing done. And Michael was such a nice guy. And so, um, 
you know, so much about letting us do what we do. That's thus, you know, playing trumpet and uh, I played uh, acoustic guitar in black and white and stuff Did like you? that. Did you? Yeah. Nice. So that was, you know, that was my claim to fame on, on the guitar on that tour. But um, it was great because, you know, um, I was kind of a um, utility man, as we call it, you know, not just keyboards, but other little parts. You know. And as someone who comes from a bit of a jazz background and loves a bit of jazz, mm. where does spontaneity lie in a show like This Is mm. It, Michael Jackson's? Because it's almost like a theatre show, isn't it? It seemed to me like it's going to be, this Very is a performance much. of this song, then it's costume change into the next one. Where Very does much. where was, was there any room for spontaneity in that show, or was it a case that we need to do the same thing every time? Well, I'll say this. For This Is It, not really, you know, um, especially as a second keyboardist. But, like, I have had other shows, like Janet Jackson, um, if you check out the HBO Live in Hawaii, um, this uh, was off for you tour. It was like mm-hmm. 2002. 2002, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, there, are, there were spots that they needed me to actually improvise. For example, um, there was a spot where Janet needed to change between, um, between acts, and they, were, they had what they were called the inflatables. Uh, uh, I think it was Escapade was a song or something. And this whole inflatable kind of city would come up and then <laughs> gnomes and elves would come out. So they needed probably two or three minutes for that to happen. But it was a situation where they didn't know exactly how much time they needed. So I would um, come up with a kind of an orchestral string sound and create something that would fill in that space. And then video would put something on the video screen that would kind of go with it. Um, matter of fact, we um, after 9-11... And, um, I remember uh, playing, and um, I, I went into a song called "America the Beautiful." Right, nice. So yeah, they yeah. put they um, immediately the video team came up with some kind of montage with American flag and this wow. whole kind of thing. So um, it was, but it was all improvised. Yeah, yeah. You know? wow. And then uh, we we hear in our uh, our uh, in ears. Um, earphones that uh, okay Janet's ready or the thing is ready and we go right into the next tune wow so there, there can be in some of these shows but yeah not in all of them I and then I also try to put my little bits in so you know if even um, less on Michael's and Janet's but on Janet's you know I might like put like a little funky piano riff and just see if someone told me not to do it <laughs> you know and then um, and then if it stayed then actually they would be looking for it. Yeah. You know, they might even uh, put an extra choreography move to it or something. Nice. Yeah, yeah yes, can influence it. Great. And um, with This Is It, you must have had some preconceptions of what MJ would be like. Mm. Um, what kind of myths about Michael were kind of debunked from your perspective having worked with him? Oh, I was told you were not, you couldn't look in his eyes. You know, I was told, you, you know, never look at him, this kind of thing, or don't speak to him and all that. And uh, he couldn't have been more warm and, and uh, you know, just... Um, really like I never really had a chance to just like have a full out conversation with him um just a few words here and there because everything was just moving so fast um he's coming from choreography rehearsal to band rehearsal to CGI uh, stuff to whatever kind of business meetings and all that but um I never felt that it wasn't like I couldn't just talk to the guy mm. you know um and you know, certainly could look him in the eye. It wasn't a problem, yeah. you know. Shook his hand and all that kind of stuff. So. And with the um, the 50 shows, he could have gone and played 50 shows in every major city in the world. Sure. Had you kind of in the back of your head thought, there's going to be more than 50 shows here, we could go and do other things elsewhere? Or were you just planning to do those ones? No, we were told um, quietly that they had planned on continuing on after the O2. So whatever that meant, you know, and of course, then maybe that would change once they actually did it because I've heard, different things about mm. you know how how willing michael was to uh to be a part of it but um no it was exciting because i was actually uh you know really looking forward to more than the o2 you know? yeah absolutely and at what point did you know that it went from kind of 10 gigs to 50 were you were you surprised by that or were you like you know i wasn't a part of it? that by the time i got in there it was 50 oh was it yeah, right uh, so okay, i right, already okay. knew that Mm-hmm. Well, so it was, I mean, it was a great gig to be kind of involved in. It's such a shame it obviously didn't happen. Yeah. Um, what lessons were learned from that whole episode, do you think? Wow, so many, you know. Uh, first of all, uh, I, even now, the way I am about any kind of work, I, I believe it once I'm on stage doing it, you know, because <laughs> it's kind of like, well, who would have thought that, that Michael Jackson would have died, you know? Um, also, um, out of that, became a lot of notoriety for me because from having been in the movie and all that so it's kind of weird that um although we didn't actually tour i still was able to kind of be um a lot of musicians kind of knew who i am and mm. such because of um because of the movie 
you know. And we at the time that was all just footage that was taken taken from Michael to his dailies to kind of like check out things, you know, and um, uh, you know make changes and all that kind of stuff. We so we were just used to cameras being around all the time. Um, and then when he died, then they you know sold the footage to Sony, and Sony made a movie out of it. But um, the thing about it was like uh, out of somehow out of all of that terrible, terrible um, you know stuff that happened, there there it has actually helped my career in some ways mm. too. If you were Kenny Ortega embarking on another kind of similar thing going forward, mm. what would you do differently? Um, well, hmm. Well, now I'm a little bit older, and you know, and I've kind of experienced the business. Um, I think really it's important to have you know really solid business that contracts and you know all that kind of stuff. That's one thing. I think um, you you really have to always um, represent yourself as someone that's you know has their business act together. Mm. So um, you know, sometimes you might be quick to go like, "Oh yeah, that's fine." You know, this, I'm not worried about it. They'll pay me, or you know. Um, um, this and that. So, and I've just seen so many things happen that I just couldn't have seen, foreseen. Mm. That I just think it's really important to um, keep your get it in writing. Yeah, get it in writing. Basically, is what I'm saying. But that's a that. difficult conversation yeah. to have mm-hmm. in that situation. So, if you're a mm-hmm. side man musician and you're, sure. you, you're understandably, you're going to really say this is such a prospect. Yeah, I'll go along with it. So you want to go? So, is it? It's a difficult conversation to start saying. Well, actually, can I have that in writing? Please? Yeah, no, it's a very. <laughs> it's a like, weird. Right, no, get him out the door. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And you know, and you do take a chance on that too. Um, when whenever you do something like that, so you have to kind of pick your spots, of course. But um, you know, at the same time, I think that when you realize that there is an opportunity to, you know, get something in writing or just have some, even if it's an email. You know, it can even be an email. Um, just protect yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's talk about on-stage communication. Sure. Because he was kind of very notorious of, of being, like, great with his cues and that kind of thing. Yeah. And he'd stick out his arm and he'd get, oh, the, yeah. get the band to do it. Sure. So tell us how you learn that process. So I'm a new musician. I've mm-hmm. not played with someone who does this kind of thing before on stage. I'm used to playing my stuff. I know what I'm doing. Right. But following these cues, talk me through what I need to be able to do. Yeah. And with Michael, it was really important because we were doing the sound effects on the keyboards and all that too. So, <laughs> all that yeah, all that explosions, time, yeah. all the, you know, yeah. so, and, you know, uh, really not just watching him, but also like, uh, like say if he's doing, an, if he's pointing in explosions on the other side of the stage, there's how much uh-huh. time is it as opposed to the, as the finger goes you know, down, right? Because right, okay. there's one point I think you know, the uh, the dancers were acting kind of Jackson like the Jackson Five. Mm, yeah, so it's right. kind of explosion, explosion, that kind of thing. So mm. like that, the one that's farthest from you know this it has kind to of be thing. a fit further. Yeah, wow, right, right, and just stuff like that. But I, I think I have to attribute um, my training, not just like say in college and school and all that, but also the Ray Charles gig. We had to follow Ray Charles like oh. constantly, and. Um, that taught me, and that was a full big band, you know. Yeah. Trump I watched the video of it. That was yeah. at Royal Festival Hall, just down the yeah, road from yes. here. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, cool. Yeah, that was an orchestra gig, but like in general, we would do mostly do big band. We had a big band that we, yeah. Uh, that one, the Royal Festival gig, there were just three of us. Um, oh, wow. Me, Jeff Pivar, and Paul Krybik, um, Jeff on guitar and Paul on drums, and um, we played with orchestra, whereas the rest of the band was uh, waiting in Texas, if I remember. <laughs> and then we flew right back, and then we were doing the big man stuff so. so in regards to following him um is it a case that because today we've spoken to people so richard Fortson from guns and roses talks about how there's an on-stage communication system no now question. so he's go yeah yeah so because yep. you know if they're performing a song he can kind of put his foot on a pedal and speak through that mic sure. and say right we're going to go do another chorus or sure. whatever it might be right. i'm guessing that didn't exist when ray charles was you know playing so right. how do you communicate how do you well, even even with that, you know, like I say, say Bet Midler, for example, I do have a talk, as a mus- uh, MD, I do have a talkback mic that only the musicians can hear in their in ears. Got it. And uh, also, you know, monitors and everybody involved in you know lights and all that kind of stuff. I can talk to anybody. And there's me. no way the audience could ever accidentally hear anything. No, 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 not if we do it right. You know, Good. I have a that special. Uh, you know, hotline mic. But what I'm talking about more is like body movements. And even as a um, even as a music director, I teach the band my body movements. Oh. So I'm like, okay, just watch me. And when I do this, you know, put that's your what we shoulder down to totally. that. Totally. Or like, what are my cutoff moves? You know, I do this when it's like that. Or if I'm trying to, if it's not fast enough, you'll see me do this or a pull back on that kind of stuff. So oh. um, Ray actually kind of taught me a lot of that because we were watching his body movements. 
That's and, amazing. Yeah. So it's basically a different language, but it's like a it's different a language. language. Wow. And, and mostly his feet, of right. all things, because Ray would pull back on tempos and then speed up and, you know, um, whatever, and, and also volumes and stuff. He could just raise his hand like this, and the whole band would come down to volume because they knew he was about to say, come yeah, down, you yeah. know. And uh, we knew him so well that by the time we saw his hand just actually start to go up in the air, boom, we were, the whole band would just kind of come down, you know, so... Yeah, you can teach. You can do a lot with your body. Wow! You know? Yeah, so it's just mm-hmm. learning that language. That's so sure. interesting. That's great. Yeah. Um, cool. And um, I mean, I've got to ask. I mean, how mm. did you find out about MJ passing? I mean, that was such mm. a crazy night for the whole world. I was in. My mum used to live in Spain, and I'd spent. Uh, she she had uh, an apartment in Spain, and I was going out there for two weeks, and I had these tickets for the shows coming up, and I thought, well, you know, two weeks it can be lovely staying with her, mm. but you know, I'm going to buy the pool. It's going to be a bit of a dull, kind of boring time. So what I'll do is I'll get this autobiography of Michael Jackson, which was like 700 pages. It was written by one of his friends, and I spent the whole two weeks reading this book, and then kind of over dinner we were talking about Michael Jackson the whole time because it was like, oh, he did this, he did this, he did this. this is really interesting. I finish the book, wow. go to bed. And then wake up like two hours later and I see all these notifications on my phone. Wow. Saying, Check that. And it was the news that he passed. And I had this like emotional investment after reading this whole book. Oh, it was so fucked up. Um, and so, I mean, you rehearsed mm. with him the night before, is that right? Or a few hours? Yeah, we, were, we rehearsed. Um, I'll never forget the night. Um, it was, uh, we finished about 12.30 at night. And um, it was, the, that day was strange. The day before he died, the, the, the strange part was that, um, and it wasn't that strange, but they um, moved rehearsal a few hours later, so we were kind of hanging around. Why? Do you know um, why they moved it? We don't know. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, with Michael, that, it wasn't, that was something that happened a lot because maybe dance rehearsal went long, yeah. or it could be anything. It could be anything, you know? right. So, um, you know, we had like a few hours to kind of sit around, and normally those are the times that you're like doing a little extra programming mm-hmm. or, you know, going through some parts that you weren't quite sure of and all that, but we were so confident that everybody was, you know, we were like throwing a football around, doing stuff nice. like that, or... Um, and I was it was something I'll never forget was I was sitting next to Sugarfoot, um, who's a very good friend of mine. Um, and we were sitting on a case, on a road case, and um, Shug- and uh, Foot tells me um, something's wrong, and I'll never forget it. He said something was wrong. Um, he felt that there was something wrong with Michael, and he, he wasn't the same old Michael he was, he, he was normally. I didn't know Michael. Foot knew him for thirty years, so mm-hmm. that's a guy that would actually know. Um, and I, you know, he was saying like, we really need the band to come together and, and be around him because he's going to need us for support and all this. And I was like, yeah, come on, count on me. I'm there, you know? Um, and then, you know, so the next morning I'm waking up and, uh, and did he turn up to that rehearsal in the end and play? Did he do it? Did yeah, he, do he came in and he came in and we did. Um, and it's funny, we actually were going down the full, we were finally got to the point where we got the show down to whatever it was, an hour and. 15, mm. 20 minutes, so, which takes a long time to get a show that tight, you know. Mm. Um, and we were actually running the show. It was like right. we were just starting to run, like, the whole show. We didn't get all the way through it, um, but, um, it, and then they called rehearsal. And it, the thing I remember the most was um, I was walking off the stage with all my stuff, you know. They said, okay, that's it for rehearsal. And I was walking off the stage, and all the dancers were already dressed for the next sh- song, mm. you know, and they were at the bottom of the stairs, they hadn't heard that rehearsal was was called, so I kind of they were like, "What's going on?" You know, so yeah, they just call rehearsal. We're done, you know. So that's like twelve thirty a.m. Mm-hmm. at night. You know, Michael was in good spirits. I could actually hear Michael in my in ears backstage sometimes laughing. You know, like um, talking to somebody. You know, whatever. Yeah. And so I thought everything was fine. The next morning, I wake up and we actually lost one of our icons. Her name was Farrah Fawcett. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. From, yeah, the same yeah. morning. I remember. Yeah, that. yeah same yeah. morning. I used to have her poster oh, when I was a little yeah. kid and all that. Um, so it was kind of sad. And I was actually packing for rehearsal because like, maybe we were starting in the afternoon, and um, people were starting to call me saying they'd heard this and that, you know, about about Michael. And I just refused to believe it till I got to the uh, till I got to the Staples Center. So um, when I got there, I could see because I was thinking maybe. You know, we're always, there was always like a TMZ or some gossip mm-hmm. uh, people kind of sneaking into rehearsals and this kind of stuff. I thought maybe he he was uh, maybe there was some kind of rumor going around because he was going to take us somewhere else to rehearse right, or right. something like that. Because Michael, oh, she so thought it might be a decoy. The whole yeah, thing. I thought it might have been a decoy. <laughs> wow. You know, like yeah. uh, you just never know with Michael yeah. Jackson. And when I got there, I could see all the police tape around, and there was a crime scene and all this, and uh, 
yeah, it was it was a horrible, horrible thing to walk into, um, you know, and uh, people were crying all, all over, of course, all over the place. And I ran into Sugarfoot, and he just was, you know, lifeless really because that was his friend. And you know, he looked. He was signing. We were signing in to go into Stable Center, and he looked at me, and he was like, uh, "Remember what I told you yesterday?" You know, and I said, "Yeah." And, and uh, yeah, and then that we we ended up going to a restaurant and um, with the band and dancers and. Um, the suits, the uh, staff, you know, the management and all that, um, and we had a we had a um, dinner together and kind of just talked, told Michael stories about the rehearsal and stuff like that, and signed, all signed this big poster, of Michael, and um, it was really really sad. Next day, I was on a flight home. Did you not have to do the um, memorial I as did. well? So you, was I that did. that was in the same venue? Is that right? It was the same venue on the same stage. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I heard you say that like mm. you, you you know everything was set up as it had been previously, but instead mm. of Michael being there, it was coughing. Yeah, it was strange. so heavy, man. Yeah, it was right? heavy. Yeah. So you had to play the intro to Man in the Mirror. I, I did. Just after Paris Jackson had done a talk, is that right? Yes. Yes. Which must have been very difficult. Oh, it was so difficult. I mean, you know, Chris, um, about as far away as that wall is, that's how close the podium was with. Wow. Uh, you know everybody that spoke um okay. so when paris said that she was like maybe you know 20 feet away from me and then i have to play the bell part for man in the mirror and i've got this uh I'm, my hand is shaking <laughs> literally shaking and um but at the same time there's a voice in my head saying don't don't mess this up because you know you're gonna hear about this because about 28 billion people are watching it or whatever it is so uh it was probably the hardest thing I ever had to play in my musical career was that simple bell part because that's when they actually picked up uh, the coffin and carried him out. difficult thing for you to process um have you processed it since you know have you looked after yourself since mm. you know that's a very you know sugarfoot yes he mm. was obviously good friends with him but you mm. work so closely it's, it's a such a massive thing that yeah. everybody had to kind of uh, experience have you processed that kind of well you know it's been it's been a tough one chris because um you know just emotionally it was it was one of those things um that seemed, first of all, it was very surreal, the whole thing, to be kind of in the eye of the storm of something like that. Um, then I think as, like, you know, uh, This Is It family, I, to me, it kind of just, everybody went completely different directions. So it wasn't like we all could kind of rely on each other and, you know, at least I felt this way. Mm. Maybe some of the other band members might feel differently. Um, you know, Judith certainly has gone on and done a great career, and a lot of the other guy, people in the band have kind of uh, done different things. Um, for me, it was like, you know, immediately I have to find some work. You know, I just kind of went back right to work and all that. Mm. And um, I even did a, um, I did a Michael Jackson um, tribute over in Japan and Korea. My first attempt, my, what I really wanted to do was I was trying to um, do something with the This Is It band that was a tribute to Michael on, yeah. my, on my own. So I, I, you know, I met with people that were able to, to uh, come up with the money to do something we did in Japan and Korea. Um, in 2010. How did that go down? What was the audience like? Because it's kind of, uh, they're the songs that you want to dance to and enjoy, yeah. but there's this emotional for them, but they're yeah. fans of the artist. So it must have been a strange atmosphere. It was strange. You know, it was, uh, there were people that were like flying in and people were giving me gifts and stuff like that because they, you know, knew I play, they wanted me to tell them something about Michael and all this kind of stuff. That part was strange, but I was so wrapped up in like the business of it and getting the band there and dealing with the, um, you know the people there uh, on a business level, and just making sure, you know, it was it was it was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. And it was hard. would you? What's your thoughts on 
so do you know that they did a show I can't, it was in America mm. like a year or two ago where like, they had a hologram and stuff like that yeah well, what's your views on that um you know it's kind of like I feel like it's not really for me to say more his family yeah you know? so um or I, any yeah. artist so let's not just mm-hmm. talk about Michael Jackson but like say if you were to get a gig yeah and it's I don't know Freddie Mercury on stage sure. or someone like that. How would you feel like it's, it's going to happen? Yeah. Like one day, oh, it's, it's definitely going to happen. It's going to happen one day. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, this, yeah. you know, it's already happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, as a kind of a stage left musician, how would you feel about that? It's a, it's mm. a strange one, isn't it? It's not. You know, I'm later in my career right now, so it's certainly not something I would be interested in doing if yeah. I didn't have to. But I'm not mad at anybody that feels like it's okay, especially if their family is all right with it. You know. I think that's a good point, get the family buying, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I watched This Is It, and Mm -hmm. when there's kind of uh, 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 previous gigs that he's done over the years, there was always one or two songs, he sung live and he danced and that great stuff, but there was always one or two songs that I could tell he was miming, a lot of people could tell he was miming, it was the same, exactly the same vocal track from the record. Um, If he was going to mime on This Is It tour, did you have to like sign disclaimers and stuff like that, or was that something you ignored? Because on This Is It, there's definitely vocals, I think, on Thriller and one or two others that are the ones from the record. Mm. Well, you have to remember this, Chris. Like, you know, This Is It is a rehearsal for nobody. <laughs> you know, so we're playing, literally playing high energy, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and it's also, you know, it's, it's like, it's basically a, a fly on the walls uh, view of a, of a rehearsal, of a major mm-hmm. production rehearsal. So there's going to be times when Michael is going to be more concerned with choreography in a specific spot or you know this kind of thing um or he's going like 80 percent of what he can do because um he knows how how he has to um pace himself in order to to do the show live you know so um i would just say that like i think really anything like that 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 has to do with this is it was just a factor of um we weren't really playing for the audience yet you know Cool. And you've worked with some of, you know, talk about some of the people you worked with. There's so many we haven't even mentioned, actually, but we will come to. But you've worked with some of the most kind of powerful and high profile musicians ever. Sure. What's their collectively, thinking kind of mm. holistically, collectively, what's their biggest weakness? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, won't, I don't even consider it a weakness because I, I'm, I'm, I think as musicians and artists, we're like basically insecure beings in a certain way anyway. Mm. And that insecurity manifests itself in a lot of different ways. You know, I know with me, it's, <laughs> I don't, you don't even want to know. I mean, like I go through a lot that um, people don't even realize that I go through because, um, you know, I just have to be that guy when it's time to hit the stage or rehearse yeah. or whatever. But the same thing with the artists. And they have a lot more on them because they have, you know, reputations and, you know everything else that goes with that. I just have. I just think that a lot of people don't regard them as like all the way human beings, but they actually are, mm. and therefore um, just that insecurity about whatever it is. You know, um, it could be it could be anything. Um, sometimes that manifests its, itself in ways that you have to kind of like circumvent them or kind of, you know help them be their cheerleader in a certain way or be their counselor in a certain way even you know mm-hmm. um, and sometimes they have to do it with you too you know so um, I've been pretty lucky to deal with to work with just really great people too you know I'm, I'm very very blessed very lucky to do, have you know a whole 35 year career with really mm-hmm. just cool people you know for the most part and as a musician who is um, you know synonymous with Michael Jackson that Lincoln you talk about like you know notoriety rising and that kind of thing I have to ask so from a purely music point of view this is a music you know podcast when you see things like like the Leaving Neverland documentary and stuff like that how does that affect you as a musician who's related to Michael Jackson's music and the link and that kind of thing does it do you worry about that from a brand point of view or marketing and stuff like that it's a very delicate sub like, area for you it's I imagine. a very delicate delicate area but to me I'm about the music you know what I mean and um, I mean it'd be one thing if it was uh, without naming names, with somebody that was like maybe not just accused, but but also um, convicted, convicted or something, yeah. you know. We're talking about Michael Jackson. First of all, you know, um, it's inconsistent to the to the artist and person that I got to work with in my mind. And secondly, uh, his music is just so incredible that that's really what I focus on. I'm actually doing, um, interestingly enough, I'm doing a Michael Jackson musical tribute 
in a few weeks. Oh yeah, nice. And the the uh, venue uh, actually came to me and told me that they they did not want to um, advertise it as a Michael Jackson tribute. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's a delicate. You know, this is yeah. nothing to do with you, but this is you know, yeah. it's such a delicate situation yeah. as someone doing a business and running their life as a musician. Um, so how how is that now? Is that going ahead or is it? It's it going ahead. It hasn't been. I mean, there may be some a few surprise people at the venue, but as soon as I walk on stage, I'll be like. Welcome to the Michael Jackson musical tribute, you know. Mm. And I have lost some. I do some work with actually an incredible impersonator. Um, his name is William Hall, and um, we. I think we really do justice to you know mm. a, a Michael Jackson experience, you know, um, with video and um, dancers and the whole thing. Um, and I've been asked to do a lot of other ones in other countries, but I will say that um, since the documentary came out, and all, I've actually lost some work because. They got canceled, you know that kind of thing, and um, and you know I can't say I don't understand that that I and I understand how people could feel a certain way about you know his um, the man, but the truth of it is what I tell people is he was acquitted in the United States and he's passed passed on. So to me, there hasn't been anything to me that's like been definitive where it's like I really completely believe that at all, not mm-hmm. at all, you know. Thank you for answering that so sure. honestly. And um, when you let's talk about when you're, you know, you, the most high profile shows you've done, all the high kind of pressured shows. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. You talked about, you know, what you, you played at the memorial there. Um, how do you prepare yourself mentally to thrive in those situations? So I do a lot of work mm-hmm. away from here, which is around kind of this phrase, kind of thriving, not surviving. So sometimes sure. we have high pressure things like to a mere mortal like myself who never made it as a musician, it might be a yeah. job interview or presentation, something mm-hmm. like that. Some of us go through that mental state of going, I just want to get this over. I want to get this through. But actually what we want to be doing is getting into the mental state of like, how can I thrive? This is an opportunity to show off what I can do. So really boiling down some of those really high pressure shows, like you did Oprah Winfrey's show, you did um, Mm. Bill Clinton's, like you played at the White House and stuff like that. You played for two presidents. You played for two presidents, right? Which we'll get to. King of Morocco (laughs) and some other kings. So how, what what are the kind of things you need to have in place mentally um, and maybe even physically in regards Mm. to your proximity to things that you need um, for you to thrive, to be Mm. your very best for those performances? Well, you know, it's it's a tough one for me, Chris, because, you know, I do deal with, believe it or not, stage fright, and you know just um, my own insecurities musically you know um, the and imposter then, syndrome you heard about the imposter syndrome no I'm not well, into the imposter that. syndrome is basically like I'm going to be found out I don't yes. I, I shouldn't be here I'm not <laughs> okay now I know what I have okay yeah. I have imposter syndrome yes absolutely but everybody gets it from the very kind of highest like absolutely j- yeah yeah absolutely yeah. and then you know the more you're out here now here I am in London and you know certain people know my reputation and all and they expect that they expect you to be you know probably even a little bit, you know, more than you are sometimes. But, you know, certainly I have bad days and good days. So um, it's to, to like show up, be on point, be on time, you know, um, be nice to people, play the parts, have all the, you know, have all my stuff together. Uh, if I'm a musical director, to be able to, to lead and all that. I mean, there's mental, mentally preparing for that sometimes is really tough. Mm. But um I just push through it. I mean, I actually even forced myself to do concertos with orchestra, you know, like Rhapsody in Blue with orchestra mm-hmm. and, um, you know, con- folk concertos or classical music concerts, which is where it, which really takes me out of my comfort zone. And um, it's, to, to you stretch know, yourself, I to guess. To stretch yeah, myself and right. push through even the fear of doing it. You know, it's kind of like it's my tightrope so to speak you know what's the worst um, case scenario that you're mm. on stage is it a case that someone says oh can we play in a different key and you haven't learned in that key or would it be what's the worst kind of thing yeah that, that would that would be hard um i mean th- i i have really good pitch and all that so but like, for me like if i was playing um rhapsody in blue with the orchestra and i i screwed up somehow there's no way to say hey can we go back and do that at the top there's no one to blame. I can't point to another keyboard player and you know look at him funny like what are you playing or mm. someone you know it's you you have full responsibility for that moment. Um, being a musical director for for a Bat Midler, um, who's very demanding but but a perfectionist and you know very very good at what she does. Um, you know sometimes I I feel to my, myself I'm thinking what am I doing here you know what if she you know I feel like a little bit of a fraud because. You know, I don't, I don't know that I'm at that level of being able to, like, hit my marks every night and stuff, but I just push through it, make myself do it, you know, and I make mistakes. Yeah. And 
have to forgive myself for the mistakes, which has been, that's been one of the hardest things for me. me so life. often a lot of people talk about that. It's, it's one way to do that is accept the fact that you will make mistakes. Yep. You'll probably make less mistakes because you're not trying not to make mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's one way you could, uh, you can go about it. But I mean, Absolutely. the fact that, I mean, if you, I cannot think of a more, if I was to think up like that most high pressured environment or situation than the situation you mm. had at the memorial. You know, mm. you're looking down, your hand shaking, you've got to play those notes, which sure. you know off by heart obviously very well. And then you've got, you know, the Jackson Brothers Brothers, you know, taking out of the coffin, like this, yeah. and you thrive, and you did it, man. You nailed it, and so like you can take confidence from that. that I did it. Know, I did it. That I is mean, such a difficult situation. I mean, it's tough. I mean, I've also had a situation. I was, uh, I was actually telling somebody today about it, where uh, I made a mistake on a, um, on an Earth, Wind, and Fire uh, show that was actually taped for television and all that. And it was a small little g- glitch, and three years later, somebody, uh, an up and coming musician. Um, I w- that I would happen to be on the same show and came up and told me, yeah, I heard that mistake you made on Reasons, you know, back three years ago. And really? Stuff. Yeah, I was kind of looking at him like, all right, thanks, you know. <laughs> what was the mistake? Bum note? Wrong note? No, or? it was, the, yeah, it was a bum note. It was actually, I totally remember because we were in the in the Caribbean and it was hot. I was My hands were sweating and I slipped on a note on a um, pretty important lick in Reasons with a uh, song called Reasons. And uh, I can't take it back. There's nothing I can do. The reasons, yeah. the reasons that we're here. The reasons that we feel I feel a little more disappear. And after this love game. But during 1993, I think you, mm. that's when you joined Earth, Wind & Fire as Correct. the band's musical director. Had you been playing with them already? No, I'd never been playing with them, and I didn't join as a musical director. Oh, okay, right. I um, I got the musical director job the following year. The following year, right, okay, yeah, cool, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, it was a great time because it was a time that they were putting the band back together again. They'd kind of been, you know, not together for I don't know how many years now. They went out in 90, mm. I think was their last tour. Um, and I believe that Maurice White was kind of like, okay, well, that's, that's going to be it, you know. And um, the way I hear it... Um, Philip Bailey, the lead singer, and Verdine, bassist, yep. um, who is actually my biggest musical influence. I saw that, yeah. yeah and I saw yeah. you did a TV show with the two of you doing kind yes. of like bass solos with each other. Oh, yeah, amazing, man. Amazing. That's the dream, isn't it? If, you, oh, if, that is, if that's yeah. your bass hero and to do that, that's... Literally the dream. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I used to uh, dream about that very thing. Wow. But, uh, yeah, but the two of them did it. Uh, I think Philip was doing a jazz festival because he does... Philip has a lot of different sides. He's got jazz albums. He's got... Um, uh, you know, gospel, everything. So I think he was doing a jazz festival and Verdine came up and joined him nice. and the audience just went bananas, you know, and they, they I think they did an Earth, Wind & Fire song or two and they looked, they decided, you know, maybe we can take this back out again um, and let's you know, talk to Maurice and, you know, if he gives us permission and we just go out there and see if people will, would be into it without mm-hmm. him, Maurice being in the band. And that's that's when I became the musical director, right at that transition. And Maurice did actually come and do more more dates with us uh, since, uh, quite a few actually, and recordings. But um, that was an important step because that is actually the Earth, Wind & Fire that's still out there right now. Um, what is it now? 2019. Yeah, so that was wow. 15 years ago. No, 25 years ago. 25. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh, and here's a question so listeners mm. uh, kind of listening to this when you visualise Earth, Wind and Fire you think mm. of kind of load of funk loads of energy yeah. smiley faces yeah. all those gigs that you would do when people are tired mm. you know been travelling that kind of thing who's you know where do you get that energy from like you you know is it down to the musical director to say come on like the energy isn't quite right or does that naturally come through the music or it's well you know something um I take absolutely no credit in that other than just being part of the party. It's actually completely genuine. We oh, love man. the music that much. We love each other that much. And when you got a guy like Verdine, that's, you know, to me, one of the greatest entertainers of all time, mm. not just one of the greatest bassists. Um, there's no way you're going to have a guy like that. We had Sonny Emery playing the drums. Um, it was just amazing, you know, one of my, one of my closest friends. Um, that energy is going to be there, and we know the end result of it. And the end result is it's infectious. People will they'll go home changed some kind of way because it happened to me back in 1976 when I saw them. Mm. Um, the feeling that I got from the band changed my life because then that's when I knew my defining moment when I knew what I wanted to do mm. in my career. 
Um, then I started doing my own bands in you know, middle school and high school and all that. But um, we know that at the end of it, we'll feel like we won the World Cup or the Super Bowl <laughs> or something. And we, that's exactly how it felt every night. And I've got to ask you about, so when you played at the White House Estate Dinner that was mm. hosted by Bill Clinton, yeah. and he invited you guys along to play. So tell us about that from beginning uh, to end. I want to hear this. This sounds amazing. Yeah, that was amazing because, you know, Bill Clinton was very popular president then, Hillary, you know, all of them. And it was the big, largest, I think, to date state dinner ever because it was, um, it was a king of Morocco. Right, yeah. okay. Um, was there the visit. So, um, and actually... Uh, we went on to play for the King of Morocco in Morocco. Wow. Okay. So that was another gig. With, uh, like, booked James. another gig. That's, it must yeah, have been impressed. <laughs> right, which was amazing, too. Um, but yeah, so that we playing the White House, of course, was amazing. And I was really into Bill Clinton at the time. You know, I was, he was, he was a sax player as well. And all that yeah, kind of he was a sax yeah. player. He's you know, a musician. Yeah. He was doing, um, he was having these big affairs, you know, at the White House that were like, you know, music was a really big part of them. Not every president was like that, mm. you know. Um, I think he and Obama were probably the two the presidents that were most into music. Yeah, and yeah. I uh, actually got to play for Obama as well. Um, we did a tribute to Motown, so it was like Stevie Wonder and Mary Wilson, the Four Tops, and you know, we're playing to them. And our musical director Greg Fillinganes, who's you know, great one of the greatest keyboard players on earth, um, was the music director and invited me and. We had, uh, in, uh, our special guests were Seal and Jamie Foxx and Jordan wow. Sparks and, um, you know, on Cheryl Crow and on and on. So it was a, it was an all-star tribute. Actually, that's on video as well. Um, wow. To Motown. Yeah. Mm. Where was that? Was that at the White House. That was White House. Yeah, you played the White under House twice. Obama. Yeah, twice. So what's it like going into the White House? I mean, the security <laughs> must be crazy. So do they, get, do you have to do like weeks before? Do you have to do like security checks and stuff like you that? You know something? They just do it. Really? Yeah, because you know they know who you are. Okay, you know right. they, so you know they've sh- they've checked you out already. Oh, yeah. oh for sure. <laughs> Before you can even walk in there, they know exactly who you are and everything you've done. Yeah. And uh, so you know, basically, it, it's not all that ex- as extensive as you think it would be. You know, um, oh, all that work is done for him. Let's get it on. Let's go. This is dedicated from the president to Michelle. played a gig to who's been in the audience that's my, most kind of got in your head mm. so it, it may it, like some it might be a family member or something like yeah. that but straight away you think oh it's got to be the president that you know that's the, you know that is that person looking at me you know how they're enjoying it yeah. but it might not be the president so who's the person that's most kind of got in your head you thought oh this person's in tonight sure well this wow so many things come to mind chris i mean you know when i was doing janet jackson's tour um she she brought along Jimmy Jam from you know who wrote all the songs oh, and wow. produced all. he was he was like kind of her you know show uh producer kind of thing so um if he would, he was really loving the show so he'd be out in the audience every night so here I'm playing his music to him that's that's memorable we, I I've done shows with Donald Trump was in the audience quite a few times really? yeah not that I care <laughs> but um and I'm sure he didn't either <laughs> uh, yeah well, he, he didn't either <laughs> But um, yeah, this um, in general, it's going to be a musician. Stevie Wonder has been in the audience. I, I've played with Stevie a few times, but Have you? yeah, Stevie's come to a lot of gigs that I was on where he just kind of unannounced, like wow, you know. And then I've done like a lot of star-studded audience type things, you know. Mm. So you know, you're looking at all the all of Hollywood and the audience and stuff. There's Denzel Washington and there's you know everybody you can think of. So I really, to me, it, those things don't affect me that much what will affect me more is if i know that like you know there's like a musician that i really really dig it's in the audience and that you know um sometimes i don't even want to know until it's over it's you know yeah, and then, I'm, wow. then i'm like okay that's great but if i knew beforehand that some you know incredible keyboard player was out there it might really mess with my head you know so yeah playing but, keyboards and knowing that stevie wonder's in the audience yeah <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah that's got to mess with your mind a little bit and yeah. what so you play pretty much i've seen videos you playing pretty much every instrument that exists <laughs> pretty much. so here's a question what skills are you currently developing currently still you know still the instruments you know um I, i'm really trying to get trumpet up to a level of you know really 
you know, killing it, you know. So, um, um, and uh, I'm also developing, you know, I'm 57 years old now, so the things for me now, I'm doing a lot of songwriting, you know, I'm trying to do things that, that are, um, you know, money makers, but mm-hmm. I don't have to, like, you know, carry my keyboard, set them up, play mm-hmm. a four hour gig, turn them down, this kind of thing. So I'm doing a lot of uh, mailbox money type of things that we say. I'm really trying to develop my career as a songwriter right now. Because you, had a, you yeah. had a song that was in Three Men and Little Ladies. Yes, I did. Ladies. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was one of your ones. And so yep. do the checks still come through with that? I they guess. do. Yeah, they do. And I've had a few more. I've had the Spike Lee movie. Um, really? Yeah, Earth, Wind & Fire did a song called Cruising, and that's been in a uh, movie. I've had about three or four movie songs, which are great. Um, I've had a gold, one gold album that I can claim um, where I wrote, but I wrote about six of the songs. Mm, nice. And that was, uh, that was in the day of um, a gold album was really 500 copies or actually sold, you know, this yeah. kind of thing. No, no streaming and all that. There was a guy named Najee who was a saxophonist. And we won, you know, some awards like Soul Train, Best Jazz. Really? Um, yeah. Wow, we were up that's against, cool. It was cool. We were up against Take Six and um, Anita Baker that year. Wow. So I was just, just to watch it on television going, like, yeah, we're not going to win. But, you know, just to even be in the category and then we won. Wow. You know? Cool. Um, there's been stuff like that that's been very rewarding, you know. Out of all the gigs and concerts and shows mm-hmm. you've played, what is the one that you wish you'd been in the audience for? Wow. Great question, Chris. I would have loved to see myself play Rhapsody in Blue with orchestra. Um, that was it was my my dad before he died. It was like one of the last things he saw me do. Oh, no. And like uh, going back to one of your uh, earlier questions, he really saw me as um, someone that would be like more studied, um, you know, musical conductor or. Uh, you know, concert yeah. pianist, this kind of thing, you know, and I used to play violin and, you know, so they were, I was getting pushed more in that direction, of like, quote unquote, serious music, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so it was a great thing before he died to see me, you know, put on the coat and tails and sit down and get a standing ovation for, for doing a, you know, full length classical concerto with orchestra. You made your dad proud, man. Well done. That's, that's great. And, um, as a bassist, have you ever mm. snapped a string? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's lethal, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not only G strings, but D strings. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I'm very physical with, with, with the bass. When you have written hundreds of songs and bass lines before, mm. what is the creative space or the creative well, if you like, uh, that you go to when you've got a blank sheet of paper in front of you? The, in, um, it's going to always be, go back to the bass players of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's always going to be... Jameson, James Jameson, Verdine, um, all the guys from all those 70s bands, which, which I love. I could name them all. Um, you know, I, I used to, they were all my heroes. Um, Chuck Rainey and, you know, um, everything that I'm going to play is going to come. Larry Graham, you know, is going to come from Jocko Pastorius. Um, I've had the pleasure of actually, like, meeting all those people and actually wow. working with them and even had a few lessons with Jocko, you know. <laughs> um, so, like, it's going to be some combination of all that mixed into some kind of, you know, whatever, paella or something. That's, that's me, you know. Yeah. But it's, I think that, um, I think Verdine is definitely my biggest influence. And there's always going to be some kind of something that makes you, uh, matter of fact, uh, this is a funny story. We both, Verdine and I did an album called, um, it was called um, um, Urban Nights 2. Mm-hmm. And it was like one of those kind of like all star albums. So it had Jonathan Butler and Ramsey Lewis and Maurice White from Earth, Wind, and Fire yeah, wow. produced it and all that. And I played bass on half of it, and Verdine played bass on half of it. And we were out on Earth, Wind, and Fire listening to it for the first time, just the two of us on the bus. And one of the songs came on that I was playing, and Verdine looked at me and he goes, This is me, right? <laughs> and I said, No, it's me. Awesome. Yeah, that was freeze that moment in time. Imagine telling your fourteen-year-old self that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's the um, most important piece of music memorabilia you own, or an item, or something that you've got that you kept from a gig or anywhere that you, you know, if the house is burning down, your instruments and family were looked after. What's the most important thing that you've got? You like? Probably my dad's guitar. Yeah, the guitar that my dad. Um, it's, it's actually a nylon string classical guitar. My dad just wanted to play guitar, so he learned a few chords and he could sing along and all that kind of stuff. But um, he's, he, um, it's actually exactly how I learned the bass, on the, uh, play the bass on Did the you? classical 
Yeah. Wow. Because it would be like my, my cousins would come over and they would be playing the guitar player. I'd be the bass player. So the bottom four strings of that guitar were, was my bass. So when I actually had a real bass in my hand, I already knew how to play it. Wow. Yeah. Right. That yeah. makes sense. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the best bit of advice you've been given? Wow. Wow. That's a good one. Don't take it too seriously. You know, I think um, bet on yourself. You know, I think that the best, your best, anyone's best, um, you know, uh, foot forward or their best chances for anything is to be themselves. You know, be yourself. And is that the advice you'd give someone else or is there any more really specific advice you'd say to someone? I say be yourself, follow your dream. That simple. And then end up playing bass and uh, yeah. <laughs> with all the greatest players it ever. Works. Yeah. It works. Um, what's the biggest setback in your career and how did you approach overcoming it? Wow, these are great questions, Chris. Um, the biggest setback in my career, um, I think it had to do with like forgiving myself for you know um, mistakes and just you know beating myself, self-criticism. Mm. Self-criticism. And I think I just adopted it... Um, a kind of, um, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? Something that to where basically the way I look at music now is, uh, is in a spiritual way of kind of like, why is music there and where, how does it happen? And um, I have to just kind of have this feeling of like, okay, in any situation, whatever was supposed to happen actually did happen, no matter how, what it was, you know. Um, that was what the people were meant to hear. That was the right combination mm. of people were there to make the music and whatever came out of it and how it was recorded or performed that was the way it was meant to be for that moment and th- somehow that helps me forgive myself because I just feel like I'm I'm not um, trying to make something happen I'm just part of something that's happening mm. if that makes sense mm. it does make sense you know? and actually I mean one thing you might want to read it when you go away if it's something yeah. you're still working on but um, this thing called Ar- it's Aaron Beck's um, cognitive restructuring which is this mm. idea that we often if we replay things that we've done in the past um, like say gigs or performances whatever it might be um, we can tell a very negative narrative of what happened just based on one little mistake sure. and it kind of eats us away and we keep thinking sure. about it a lot and actually what's d- the thing to do in that situation is to look at the objective data and go so what did other people think and most people will go I didn't even notice it or it was great and Absolutely that kind of thing and we can true. beat ourselves up about those kind of things and it's called cognitive restructuring it's really interesting but I will check that out I love that the, right. the human condition is that we really focus on that negative bit and then we have this narrative that we go round and round and round and it's it's it, we just need the objective data what other people think to, to get that actual reality and that balanced view of how things went it's so true chris because you know a lot of times i'll say that there's you know when i feel like i flood the show and it's like okay let me just forget that one that's when i get an email from somebody saying you know that show really changed my life or exactly. you know it's always something like that you know? so listen to that more than the inner voice so it's, it's kind of the, the thing around that um who are the best or most underrated stage left session musicians that we should kind of give some credit Ooh, to? God, I, I wish I had an hour to just, <laughs> just list them. The top three. Underrated. Okay, um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Good, that's a great, great question. Uh, Wow. You know, because, you know, and it's even a harder question now because um, with the Internet and with social media now, there's, you know, I'm getting turned on to musicians that I wouldn't normally know who they were. You know, like I think Mono Neon is just incredible. Um, there's on and on and on. Um, but there's, uh, wow, that's really, a, that's really a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that are out there right now still doing it. Yeah. Who, who deserve mm. a shout out that... Maybe, you know, because a lot of, you know, session musicians... Sam don't... Sims. My friend Sam Sims is one yeah. of the best bass players in the world. And he's played with everybody in the world. But he's such a... Um, he's the kind of guy that probably, you know, is rarely on social media, you know. Yeah. Um, he's a, a bassist from Atlanta, mm. you know. I saw I saw a lot of people in Atlanta that were, like, you know, um, incredible. Um, but they're not in L.A. or they're not in New York or this kind of thing, you know. So they may not get the notoriety... Um, he's definitely one of them, I would say. Um, there's, there's, there are many, there are many. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, if I think of any other ones, I'll come back to it. <laughs> no worries, yeah. that's fine. So, um, 
you know, you've done a bit, you mentioned earlier, you do a few masterclasses and stuff like that, and you like kind of passing your wisdom on if you can. Yeah. Um, what bad habits do you have as a musician, mm. technically, that mm. you would advise young musicians not to do? Oh, God, so many. <laughs> so many well you know my piano technique is not great because I didn't do my scales you know and I didn't do my um, Hannon and Cherney exercises and all that so I'll slide on notes you know like I'll instead of like playing using two fingers to play two notes I'll slide from one to the other but I'm so used to doing it that it just kind of became part of my technique even in classical yeah um, on the bass I'm just horrible because I'm self-taught um, you know, my technique isn't great. I do play upright bass as well. But um, somebody, I see a lot of the, um, I was just talking today about bass players how, who have like really great technique and their hand hardly moves and they go to the notes that are like right under their fingers and all that. Whereas mine is a lot more. Sliding up and down. Yeah, slide yeah, up yeah. and down. Or, you know, I like the way that note sounds on the E string better than the A string. So I'll use that one instead. Or, um, you know, just just gets a little bit haphazard, but you know, so is Rudy and White's, and he's like to me the greatest, you know, of all time. So um, I don't think there's necessarily technique is everything, but I think it definitely will help. You know, gives you a leg up. Um, you know, it's better to have technique than not to have it. <laughs> How, if you look back at, you know, being 14 and seeing Earth, Wind and Fire, and now kind of fast forwarding onto where we are now, mm-hmm. how does that success in the music industry in reality compared to what you thought it would look like? Mm, good question. You know, the thing about it, Chris, I was always concentrated on the work, so I never really thought of it as like, wow, I'm really successful because I play with whoever, you know. Me, I was like, okay, I'm a working musician. And you know, the thing about it was, even when I was playing with Earth, Wind & Fire, I was still playing with, you know, Rochelle Farrell or, you know, um, whoever, Maxwell or Diane Reeves, Natalie Cole, you know, this kind of stuff. Wow. I was just always, um, you know, if Earth, Wind & Fire had three months off or something, boom, I'm doing a Natalie Cole tour or, you know, um, Roberta Flack or this kind of thing. Um, I actually had music, musician friends that would get mad at me because they thought I was hogging up the work because not only was I taking other gigs, but I was doing them on different instruments, mm. you know. So um, I never, I never, I'm still a hustler. I've always been a hustler and I've, actually probably more of a hustler now than I used to be so I've never had that like sit back on my laurels and you know like yes I was a Michael Jackson's keyboardist kind of you know it's never been like that the the business has changed so much now too that um, even though even with the accolades you still gotta hustle you know so um, yeah I mean to me I just I'm just doing what I've always been doing and uh, still hoping for success and that brings us on to the Mo Pleasure Band. Is that the name of the yeah, band you're going to? Yeah, nice one. So yeah. what you got coming up? So what can we look forward to? Yeah, oh, God, so many things. I mean, I'm so proud of my band. I've got Luke Smith on keyboards, Mike Brown, um, a, a guitarist. Um, I've, I've had a few lead singers, Ivy Chanel, Kedma. It's been uh, one of my lead singers. I've got um, Josh McKenzie and sometimes Mark Mondesir on the drums and Tuca Milan on the percussion and all that um jamie michael harris saxophone or dan reinstein sometimes and um they're just incredible musicians and i've been now four years um like working with some of the same ones you know and so it's gelled into this really cool family you know so um and we all read each other's minds you know so which is which is amazing so i just can't wait to get on the stage i like having like a certain amount of structure and a certain like I kind of like Miles Davis approach to it. So um, even though we may be playing even the same songs, they might go in a whole different direction. Right, nice. You know? um, so, uh, so never playing the same song the same way twice? I hope not. You right. know? And I try, what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll be the one that kind of throws the wrench in the works. When everybody thinks everything's going the way it normally does, I'll be like, break it down, bop, and then I'll just start, I'll say, you know, percussion solo here. You know, so now we just got to deal with it. How do we get out of it? I don't know. Let's figure it out. You know, (laughs) and um, and I I'm very much a band guy. So even in my own band, I'm never trying. You know, I'm musical direct for so many people. When my band, I almost completely stay out of it. Oh, other than and does someone else do it? Well, there is just every we all do it. We all do it. You all do it. So it's kind of like if the idea comes from the keyboards, let's go with that. Go with it. You know what I mean? So. 
And what's coming yeah. with Bette Midler? So are you going on tour? Or? Oh, I sure hope so, Chris. Right now, she, she teases us every now and then and says we're going to go back on tour. The last tour was 2015, mm -hmm. and we ended up with two nights at the uh, O2. Wow. Yeah, which was great. Um, I remember it was like... It was right near my birthday in July. We ended up. She finally got um, to play the O2 at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Honestly, that was yeah, yeah, that yeah. was kind of kind of cool. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize they had a handprint of Mike Michael there too. Do they yeah. really? I didn't know that. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah. So um, yeah, that was. So I'm hoping she does. She, you know, she's um, very, very uh, capable of doing it. She still sings great and she dances and all that. And tells jokes. She's, she's amazing. You know. And a question we ask, uh, the final question we ask everybody on the Stage mm. podcast is what fears do you have for the music industry mm. and how might those fears be addressed? Wow, I have so many. I have so many. Um, I fear that, um, that the actual music part of the music industry gets lost in so many other things, you know, whether that be... Um, not just business, but fashion, video, and all this kind, of, and you know, uh, internet, and all that kind of stuff. That maybe we're concentrating on the wrong things sometimes, and that um, t actual talent, actual really good songs, and those kind of things are actually being um, ignored in a certain way, um, and that we're going to find ourselves in the future looking back still. September will still be, be, be on the radio, mm -hmm. you know, or be people will know where Earth, Wind & Fire is mm -hmm. forever. But I think that we might look back at some of this time period as like, especially for pop music, is what I'm saying, because mm -hmm. certainly there's a lot of great music out mm -hmm. there right now by y young people, um, that we may be looking at it as kind of like, wow, that was a moment, that was a time period that we kind of were... Took the eye off the ball. We <laughs> took our eye off the ball. Like, you know, the lyrics weren't really about anything or, you know, the melodies were kind of, you know, two notes, which isn't always a bad thing. Um, there's so it's interesting you said that because mm -hmm. a friend of mine said that um, mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, would... Prince have turned out to be his great guitarist mm. if he had to dedicate so much of his time updating his Instagram page. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. And I find it's weird for me because, you know, now here I am at this age and that's a really, the social media part of my life is important. And, and it's exhausting and it takes up time and resource, which you are then taking away from doing the creative bit. Like. It is. I'm too busy doing it to like really report on what I'm doing. Yeah. Luckily, there's a lot of people that are around me that like, you know, take pictures and videos and mm -hmm. help me out with my social media. But I just think that, like, uh, you know, and I'm so much the opposite. I'm actually more, I think, more of an introvert mm. than an extrovert. Like, I, I have no desire to tell anybody, hey, here I am eating a hamburger yeah, you know, yeah. in Berlin or something. I don't really care. But um, these things are important, you know, so um, it's become a different industry. It's just, so it how is. do we, what needs to change? Um, I, think, I think we really need to concentrate on what stirs the heart. You know, I think we need to concentrate on, you know, what is it in music that really gives you those goosebumps, you know, um, as opposed to like, you know, um, well, so-and-so had it, so let's make it like that, you know, like I get, I get a lot of that. Hey, can you, can you can make it sound kind of like, you know, something that's really popular? And then the next thing that's popular, hey, can you really make it, can you make it, you know, so we're kind of like, to me, I think we're kind of chasing, you know. Our yeah. tails a little bit, yeah. deep, you know. Whereas, like, instead of like digging really deep and trying to come up with something that that's truthful and from the heart, that will stir other people, um, that stir their hearts. Thank you so much for appearing on the Stage F podcast, Mo. Uh, you've yeah. lived the dream of every young musician who's listening to this. Thank you for your wisdom, your insight, and candor. Oh, and you. we've loved chatting. And best of luck with the upcoming shows. And uh, thanks for being such a great guest on the Stage F podcast. Ah, oh, thank you, Chris. I enjoyed myself. It was, it was great. Can you remember the guitar part that you said on acoustic for Black and White? Oh, you, you're going to be ready for this? It's... Is that it? America. <laughs> really? Nice yeah, one. it's like that simple. <laughs> okay, There's like it. maybe one other part. That's, <laughs> That's it. Cool. Okay, thanks for being such a great guest. Ah, uh, pleasure, Chris. Thank Cheers. You. It's been Cheers. good. What a joy that was um, for that interview. Genuinely, I was kind of sitting there thinking this is one of the best episodes ever of the Stage Death podcast. All killer, no filler. What 
honesty and 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 um, insight really about what it was like working on the This Is It tour. Um, Mo is going to do one of our Stage Death Nights uh, supper clubs. You may know that we uh, are very lucky that we, you know, my partner is a, an award winning chef. Does this amazing food. Um, go on our website. There's a page on there about it. Um, and uh, you know, Mo will be playing in our lounge in London if you're London based or UK based, uh, and he'll be playing a set uh, for just eight other people uh, whilst we all have amazing food and he joins in for the food as well. So um, yeah, that's going to be coming up soon. We're going to be working out some dates for that. So thank you to Mo for doing this. Um, it's been a very special episode and we'll see you next time.